Hubert Selby Jr., né en 28 à Brooklyn juste avant la Grande Dépression. Un signe peut-être. Profession, écrivain. Signe particulier, considéré comme le fou furieux de la littérature américaine, ne fait partie d'aucune école, d'aucun courant, d'aucune mode. Tuberculose, alcool, héroïne, HP, prison et tout le reste. Côté livre, c'est d'abord Last Exit to Brooklyn en 64. Une bombe pour l'époque, scandale, procès pour obscénité, un succès de 2 millions d'exemplaires. Avec la jolle en 71, les choses se gâtent et le public ne suit plus. Résultat, premier échec critique et commercial. En 76, il récidive avec le démon, sans doute son roman le plus apprécié, mais qui se solde à son tour par un flop. Dommage. Dommage aussi en 78 pour Retour à Brooklyn, qui subit le même sort. Chanson de la neige silencieuse paraît en 86. 15 nouvelles magnifiques et puissantes, mais depuis, plus rien. Côté ciné, toutes les tentatives d'adaptation de ses livres ont échoué. Rendez-vous manqué, lobbying, censure, pas de chance. Finalement, en 88, c'est Ouli et Del qui tourne Last Exit to Brooklyn. Aujourd'hui paraît Le Soul. C'est le premier roman de Selby depuis 20 ans. Voilà. Voilà pour le CV, l'état civil. OK, everybody. We're going to bring up our feature act of the night. A dashing young man out of Brooklyn, New York, here in the life for a while. Wooing everybody. He's going to woo you tonight. Hubert Selby. Yeah, you know, pretty, huh? <laughs> This is absolutely charming. Can't see shit, but it's charming. <laughs> I tell you what. You know, everything is about relationships. People, automobiles, oh, that's a mother. Let's see. So we might as well continue with that. Here's one called, It Takes One to Know One. Three years in bed. Four operations in one year. Half my chest ending up on a Dempsey dumpster, an incinerator, or on a garbage dump. Food for seagulls and rats. Endless, torturous, godless nights, and interminable, painful, fatherless days. Where were you, Pop? Sliding off a bar stool and pissing in your pants? Or passed out in the cellar, fetally curled in a pile of coal ashes? And how far away were the garbage cans that held the remnants of life in that building, as the gulls and rats held the remnants of mine in savage beaks and yellow teeth? Every three weeks, another operation, another three ribs removed. More of the breath of life collapsed and squeezed into submission. Every three fucking weeks, another trip on that gurney, lying in bed in the morning, listening to it come down the hall, out of sight but recognized by the flapping wheel. Every three weeks I'd climb on that fucking thing. Then, hours later, be carefully lifted off and placed on a bed and hooked up to pumps, hoses, and tubes. Every three fucking weeks. I don't know if I've ever gotten over that experience, because I was a, see, when I was, when I was young, Like when I was 15, when I started going to see, I was almost six feet tall, 170 pounds. I was a football player. I was a very physically active kid. And then all of a sudden, that is totally gone. The physical world is no longer mine to live in. And by the time I got out of the hospital, I had 10 ribs cut out and I had a lung collapse, the piece of the other one cut out. And I had used an experimental drug to keep me alive. And it impaired my vision and my hearing, and my inner ear was almost totally destroyed. I couldn't walk properly. I'd stagger, I'd fall down in the dark. It was, all my muscles were petrified from it. And in addition to that, I got hepatitis and the blood transfusions. I'm still dealing with that. What happened? You see, I'd been given up for dead like four times. And I was out now, and I had, by this time I was married. We had a daughter about two years old. And this was around the Christmas holidays. My wife was working part-time in Macy's, and I was home alone with our daughter. And I had this experience. I knew that someday I was going to die. 
And it wasn't going to be like had been happening almost and somehow staying alive, but I was going to die. And just before I died, two things would happen. Number one, I would regret my entire life. And number two, I would want to live my life over again, and then I would die. And that absolutely terrified me. The thought that I would live my entire life, however many years it is, and then look back on it and say, Jesus Christ, Cubby, you blew it. You blew the whole thing and then die. That terrified, I couldn't. So I had to do something with my life. So I ended up buying a typewriter and uh, wrote a letter to somebody. <laughs> I sat there for about two weeks looking at the typewriter because I had no ideas or anything. I'm looking at this thing. Uh, so I wrote a letter to somebody and that started. Then I started writing something, something that eventually became the first part of The Queen is Dead. Georgette était PD, un PD dans le vent. Elle, il, n'essayait pas de s'en cacher par des discussions sur le mariage ou des discussions d'hommes, mais elle satisfaisait son homosexualité en tenant secrètement un album contenant les photos de ses acteurs préférés, ou bien d'athlètes découpés dans les journaux, ou bien en surveillant les activités de jeunes garçons ou encore en allant dans des bains turcs ou dans des vestiaires pour hommes, lorgnant du coin de l'œil tout en se protégeant derrière une façade de virilité soigneusement défendue, redoutant le moment où, dans un cocktail ou un bar, cette façade commencerait à s'effondrer sous l'effet d'alcool, ou bien serait complètement démolie lorsqu'essayant de toucher ou d'embrasser un jeune homme séduisant, il serait repoussé d'un coup de poing et... sale tantouze Ensuite, ce serait l'hystérie, les excuses incohérentes et la fuite, mais il éprouvait une certaine fierté à être homosexuel, en se sentant intellectuellement et esthétiquement supérieur à ceux, en particulier les femmes qui n'en étaient pas. La troisième personne me donne la liberté de me bouger. Maintenant, vous allez remarquer, même si, basiquement, les livres de la troisième personne, dans vous voyez beaucoup de parler de la troisième personne. C'est comme un piece de musique, comme dire, written in, in, in C major, but they're, they're drifting around in various of the keys, of course. Um, so I start with a, third, with a third person, and then, like this illustration I was saying before, instead of saying he opened the letter, I say, opening the letter, he found, he found something, whatever, inside. Now, what the heck is this? I never said, so I'm just, I'm now I'm in the first person. I'm switching. Well, I don't have rules. I, boy, rules can be a killer. Um, I respect certain laws, and I respect them very much. But as far as things like tense and time and space are concerned, I try to make most of the writing as immediate as possible. And I don't mind switching around tenses and persons and voices, third person, first person. I just segue back and forth as, as the work demands that. I don't do it arbitrarily, but just as the work demands. And it takes a lot of work to learn how to do that without people stumbling as they read. And again, I think I've succeeded in that because no one has ever had a problem reading it, as far as I know, because no one's ever, ever mentioned that. But quite often I try to make the action as immediate as possible. So I use a lot of present participles in my writing and things of that nature. Celine, say that the death was a great inspire. I can't agree more. <laughs> I mean, how did I get started? You know, with the man in a white nightgown over my shoulder. Absolutely, see, I've always known Even as a kid, although maybe as a kid I couldn't actually define it. But I've always known you know nothing about life until you've died. You have to die in order to have any insight and or understanding of life. And then eventually you see they're one and the same. So absolutely, you have to die. And if I am going to be honest, and I must be honest, I'm not saying every writer 
must be or should be or has to be, but me, I have to be as honest as I can possibly be. So I'm put, I'm always putting myself on the line. Yeah, my skin is there, my bones are there, my entrails are there. You know, it's a horrible thing, but no, he's right. I absolutely agree with him. You have to die. If you're not willing to die, you will never live. take place in New York. Why did you move to LA? Well, basically, what was really happening, although I was unaware of it at the time, was I was trying to get away from me. But I found myself here. I mean, it's a funny thing how much we try and get away from ourselves, and yet we always bring ourselves with us. It's one of those things of life. Every, every ex New Yorker is always talking about how great New York is, and it's true. But what I realized was the New York that I miss does not exist anymore. One of the things, the most important thing about any town or any memory are the people. That's what you're missing. Those people that I miss weren't there. Some of them weren't even alive. And the whole town changed, as the whole world changed. So I may just as well be here with the friends I have and back there that is not the New York that I miss and does not have the people that I love. Before I started writing, when I had that experience that I mentioned before, I knew I was a frustrated teacher and a frustrated preacher. So when I was offered the chance to, to teach down here, um, it satisfied that, that thing. And I said, yes, I've been delighted. Scared, 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 scared about doing it. Right now, I just get a little afraid. Before, I used to be terrified. For the first few years, I was terrified. Now, I'm just nervous. So, big difference. <laughs> Bill Perkins. Oh, I hi, Bill. Maybe you've met before. Oh, Am I on candid How camera or? Uh, yeah, it's sort of the French documentary. I see. Do, I do see. Far, are, you? are we supposed to do something exciting? Am I supposed to oh, kiss sure. you madly? <laughs> oh, please. Is Jim here by any chance? He's out to dinner at the moment. Ah, uh, every day he eats. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> mm-hmm. How are you feeling? Pretty well. You look mm -hmm. terrific. Yeah, I feel all right now. Oh, it was just but a short time. But last week I couldn't make it. Yeah. So Jim was dear enough to go down and uh -huh. welcome the class and give them the handouts. Tom, did um, Jim leave any papers for me? I had him pull a grammar exam. Okay, let's see what he... He did yeah. not mention specifically any papers for you, but he has a lot of paperwork on his desk. So, <laughs> right. yeah, there might be in the pile here. Let's see. Diagnostic what we grammar test. Okay. Uh, that reminds me, I should check my mailbox in here. Excuse me. Mm hmm. Tell me again what this is for. It's a documentary about your study. I life. see. Yeah. Very good. Well, you have a fine subject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very respected man. Yeah. Uh, that's why he made it. Yes. Who's this for, exactly? 
for Selby. Oh, yes. That's definitely a great subject. Did he leave the uh, the building? Is he is he still here? No, he's in the... Uh, oh, okay, okay. I was... Do you know him well? This gentleman? Yes, I have. I just know what great work he has done. Have you read his books? Many of them. Yes, I have. With joy. Now, I need to get down to class. I'll say good night. Hey, Kate. Shall I tell them all those racy things I know about you? That I don't mind. Just don't tell them the truth. Okay. <laughs> Avoid that at all costs. Uh, absolutely. You have a license for that? I don't consider it teaching because, for, for one thing, you can't teach writing. The only way you learn how to write is by writing. But what you can help people do is learn how to rewrite. And I also try and help them see whatever old ideas they may have somewhere in the back of their minds that they're not consciously aware of that is preventing them or inhibiting their ability to just be the writer they can be and want to be, to just let it come out and not impose rules on it. What it, what it might be, and I'm, I'm just, this is a generalized kind of statement. I suspect that at least a very large contributing factor may be lack of control of the style. It's like style for its own sake, it just, and that's cool, I mean, I'm not saying to try and stop it. All I'm saying is that when you go back to reread, try and recognize when it's happening. Because I really have the, the strong sense that once you corral, to use a Texas word, <laughs> corral, once you corral that style, and you keep it within the appropriate boundaries of your vision of the book, you will see a whole different perception of the book. And then if there are other faults or weaknesses, I think they will become more apparent and much easier to correct. You see, you start to pick up a little bit here on, on that second page, 125. And I love the way you get into this thing here. It's really, this is something that you do very, very well. At the bottom of 125, the sun is, is so familiar. Now, see, what a, what a beautiful use of words is. The sun is so familiar. Wow, that is, that's a brilliant little line because it really tells me <clears throat> a lot about the narrator, maybe not so much right there at that instant, but it's the kind of thing that resonates and hangs in there. So the more I read, the more I understand. No, oh, the sun is familiar. We're not talking about specifics of direct, it's familiar. And of course, it has to be, you can't look at it, I think he says that, that you can't, can't look the sun in the eye. No, you just have to be aware of it. I'm closer to Celine in many ways than any other writer. But American writers, I guess William Carlos Williams, I feel very, very close to him as a mentor. And then in contemporary writers, there are people I like very much. And whether or not we have anything even vaguely in common, I don't know. But I love people like, like William Kennedy or Cormac McCarthy. And, Harry Cruz, I really, really love their work, as well as my friend Gil, and there's a fellow named Michael Stevens. Richie Price I like considerably. He's a wonderful, wonderful writer and a lovely man. There's a lot of people that I really enjoy reading. This is not it. We're in the wrong place.
two of them. So, how does it feel to find your own books in the library? Very difficult. <laughs> I, I'm, I, it just reminded me of something I've done, oh, more than once. When I've been in a bookstore, I always kind of saunter over to that section to see if they have my books there. It's, um, it's very nice when, when they have your books, but it makes you feel very bad if they don't. So what I tell myself, if I don't find them on the shelf, it means that either if it's a store they sold out, or if it's a library, they're in circulation. Ses amis l'appelaient Harry. Mais Harry n'enculait pas n'importe qui. Uniquement des femmes, des femmes mariées, avec elles au moins on avait moins d'emmerdement. Quand elles étaient avec Harry, elles savaient à quoi s'en tenir. Pas question d'aller dîner ou prendre un verre, pas question de baratin. Si c'est ce qu'elles attendaient, elles se foutaient dedans. Et si elles commençaient à lui poser des questions sur sa vie ou à faire des allusions à une liaison possible, il se barrait vite fait. Harry refusait toute attache, toute entrave, tout embêtement. Ce qu'il voulait, c'était baiser quand il avait envie de baiser et se tirer ensuite, avec un sourire et un geste d'adieu. I enjoy things that are real. So I don't think of my people that I create as literary characters. I think of them as people. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be such things as literary characters. I'm not I'm knocking that in any way. I'm just simply saying that I don't create literary characters. I do everything I can to create living people. Do you sometimes take notes in public places like this? Oh, not much anymore. I used to. I've always carried a pad and pen with me for more than 40 years. But lately, it just doesn't happen very often. Usually, the ideas seem to wait until I'm at my desk. But I did all the time, on subways, on buses, walking the street, wake up in the middle of the night. You always have to get it down, because if you don't, it's gone forever. And somebody else may get it, you know. How do you build your characters? Well, they, every story comes as a whole package, and that includes the people. And, my, and usually it starts with the people, because for me that's the story. And then I have to just get to know them, and I get to know them as I create them on the paper. I get to know them, and I guess where they come from, of course, is my observations I've made all my life, not conscious, but just living, just being alive, being exposed to all manner of people through my own perception, of course. Okay, you need dime souls to be cool, but this fucking maniac is sitting in the window with all this broken glass trying on shoes. <laughs> so I climb in with the hammers and chisels and start whacking away at the silver dollars. Naturally, Freddy stays in the car. He's always the driver, but he's cool. If there was heat, he'd never split. So I'm banging away at these things and working up a sweat. I mean, they're really fucking welded to the sign. And no legs is going ape shit trying on shoes. I mean, I can't believe this dude. Covered with glass and walking around the window. Hey, what do you think, eh? Look sharp? I think you're a fucking asshole. I'm fucking busy, huh? Well, shit, ain't no mirror to see. Why don't you grab a hammer and chisel and give me a hand? But he keeps asking how each pair looks and which looks better. And I'm sweating my balls off trying to get these fuckers loose. And he won't let up. And now he wants to know if he should get a brown pair, too. I mean, I can't believe this nut. Living in New York, you have a rich, rich speech. You have accents that, you know, 
everyone imaginable in all kinds of combinations. I had, there was a fellow, he was an Italian, came over here. He worked on the Irish dock, so he spoke broken English with a sort of an Irish brogue and an Italian accent. You know, you get all these kind of crazy combinations. And the music of the speech is marvelous. So I write by ear. And what happens is the story starts to gestate, and I kind of, I can feel it happening. Just kind of feel it. And so then when it's ready, I sit down, I start writing. And what I do is I visualize what's going on. And then I have to find the perfect word to describe what I hear, what I feel, and what I see. Because I want to do more than tell a story. I want to put the reader through an emotional experience. And I want to make everything simple and obvious. That's why Beethoven is the only conscious influence in my life as a writer. Now, this is my CD collection over here. And as you can see, I probably have more Beethoven records than any other individual composer. Uh, this is all Beethoven. This is all Beethoven. And it makes sense because, as I've said, he's the only conscience, conscious influence I've ever had as a writer. So it makes sense that I have a lot of his records, but there is one man today, he's an Estonian who's living in Berlin, a man by the name of Arvo Part, that is absolutely beautiful, a marvelous composer. And this man, I have seven of his CDs here, this man can use silence as well as any composer who, he, who has ever lived. He's really remarkable and stunning. And from the time I get up in the morning until the time I go to bed, I always have music playing in the house. There's always music in this house, except now. My stereo broke, it's in the repair shop, and I just, I have no music. I feel lost. I'm walking through a forest here of silence that doesn't make any sense. The only music I have is my rocker bunny here that my wife gave me for Easter. But he's a remarkable little guy. Dig this, man. But the company that you can get these these jacks from won't fit here? I'm not sure this one is free. I'd rather have a quarter inch jack. You mean the, the big one? Yeah, I'd rather. 9847. Oh, ah, then it should be here then. Can't figure out how it got sticky because there's never anything spilled on it. And Oh, it looks like you put in the, the kitchen, around the kitchen. No. No? No. So now, a little better than before. Oh. Yeah. So I thought that you put it somewhere in the kitchen, something like that, when you're cooking. Sometimes the in the oven when I'm baking chicken. Oh. <laughs> ah, I see, that's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, here. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. I hope I don't see you again too soon. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you think you just want to... Beethoven had the power. And I'm not trying to say that I think he was the greatest artist that ever lived, but I came across Beethoven at a point in my emotional life where he really did something for me emotionally. And so he, he was the man for me. He saved my life and he helped guide me in, in, a, a, as a writer. And one of the great things about Beethoven is that he could be simple and obvious, everything almost up on the surface. So simple that it is extraordinarily profound. And that, that's what I, I, I try and do as a writer, is make it as simple and direct as possible. Matter gets hot. Might be a good idea to stay oh. indoors if you can and check your dial too. 
I'm in business. Ah. I've known Cubby for 10 years. I wouldn't, but I'm in my bathroom. <laughs> uh, I met Mr. Selby when I moved into the building in uh, 91, so seven years now. But for the last five years, I've known him pretty intimately. Have you read his books? No, but I saw a last exit to Brooklyn, I think, four times. I'm ashamed to say. And no one, all my friends who grew up in New York that, that were influenced by his writing, are very ashamed of me because I haven't gone through any of his books. What's his name? Hubert Selby. Oh, okay. It's your neighbor. He has written Last Exit to Brooklyn, The Willow Tree. I haven't started The Willow Tree yet, but The Last Exit to Brooklyn was definitely, I mean, it was a very powerful, very, very powerful. I could identify with a lot of the um, neighborhood kind of people that he wrote about. My friend Joel lives right upstairs from uh, Cubby, and um, so I've known Joel before I moved into the building, and uh, one time I was coming over to visit Joel, and he said, you know, this guy down here, he wrote The Last Exit to Brooklyn. I said, oh my God, are you kidding? I'm crazy about him. I just love him. So we'd always walk by and I'd say, hi, hi. Of course, he didn't know me then, but yeah. So I was a big fan before he even moved in. Uh, I know that he uh, likes my cat, uh, my little cat, Hobo, who is right here. And uh, I know that um, he likes to keep up his Christmas decorations year round. And so you'll see on my door that I have kept up my little uh, uh, Christmas red ribbon up year round as well as a little homage to uh, Hubert here. It's, it's a neighborly thing. And we're trying to get the whole building to do it, but they don't seem uh, as receptive. Oh, I think he's very devoted to a lot of stuff that he's involved with, and I, I'm not at liberty to discuss that, but uh, he's a very devoted man to whatever he wants to do. And he's a very sweet guy. What happened? <laughs> Did you find anybody that could read in this building? <laughs> well, is this the most poorly read building in L.A.? <laughs> Does anyone have a book? <laughs> we have all the books, we just don't read. Yeah, well, he's from Texas. So I forgot. I should be exonerated. Yeah. Big state. Big state. Expurgated. Oh. Expurgated too. <laughs> anyway, I gotta go to the garbage bin. <laughs> if anybody wants to come, you're welcome to. <laughs> Bring some back for me. <laughs> would you like? Would you like glass, paper, uh, uh, or what uh, kind of roughage? Paper.
I found out many years ago where I realized that I kept looking for something to make me happy, chasing it, chasing it. And then I realized I can't get happy because happiness is a natural state of being. And when I stop doing the things that make me unhappy, I will simply experience happiness. Some people reproach to you to indulge in caricature. Well, I guess I'd have to ask them to define their terms. I don't know what they mean by caricature. They mean that it's not realistic? Well, I agree with them. But an artist... One of the things I think that an artist does is make visible what's invisible to everybody else. Every day, that doesn't make any difference what the medium is. If it's painting, music, writing, whatever. The artist is a way of bringing to light what other people ignore and doing something with it. Which of your book is the most accomplished for yourself? Most accomplished for myself. Well, I think the room is in a way because I spent six years writing Last Exit and that mostly entails learning how to write, learning how to clarify thoughts, learning how to get the thought on paper with the least amount of trouble and words, and the greatest degree of clarity. So I'm incapable of really judging the results too well. But the room, and by the time I finished the room, I put it aside and I didn't look at it for 12 years because it's the most disturbing book I think anybody has ever written. Oh, really disturbing. But after 12 years I reread it and I loved it. I was amazed because I could see in that book that I really did learn how to write. That book on the surface is extraordinarily simple and very obvious, and I therefore I think it is probably profound. So I think from that point of view, it's the most satisfying because I was able to see what I've learned. La brume persistait. Ou bien était-ce la lumière qui filtrait à travers son avant-bras et ses paupières closes Non, c'était pas la lumière. Rien qu'une lueur. Faut chasser. Chasser un flic. Chasser un putain de flic. Jouer à un nouveau jeu. La chasse au fumier de flic. Deux têtes couvertes de crêpes. Coupables. Les femmes pleurent. Les mères de leurs gosses. Les mères. Leurs mères. Toutes. Dos tourné, voûté, sanglotant, désespoir, chagrin, douleur, bébé affamé qui tête un sein vide, ventre gonflé, désespoir, pas de direction, rien que la mort, une arme à feu, pilule, non, une corde, un tabouret qu'on renverse d'un coup de pied, lente agonie, très lente, douleur, oui, souffrance, bleui lentement, très lentement, langue gonflée comme les ventres, yeux exorbités, un gargouillement, si lent. Sans, tellement lent, un petit somme, et alors un petit temps de veille. Ensuite, il glisse vers une zone apaisante entre veille et sommeil. Obsession runs throughout all the book. Obsessions of the mind. That's always been, been my, my obsession. <laughs> Look at the obsessions of the mind and how they tend to alter and usually destroy our lives. Could you say that you were a victim of obsession in your life? Oh, yeah. I'd say it. So would a lot of other people. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Maybe the earliest one was trying to be good. I was addicted to trying to be good. I was addicted to drinking milk. It was an absolute addiction. I was like this. Four and five quarts a day. I'd, I can remember having a glass of milk um, with my with a meal, and I'd tell myself, "I'm just going to have one sip. That's all. I'm going to have one sip and go back to eating." I'm just going to try and condition myself. I'd pick that glass up, and I couldn't get it down. It was 
It's like a wino. I just couldn't get it down. And then, of course, by the time puberty came along, masturbation was another addiction. You know, it's just, and then sex. Uh, and then, of course, there's alcohol and drugs and uh, women. Maybe that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe that an author needs to have experience to what you write about? Well, yes and no. Um, I have to look at my experience from many different perceptions. I have to be able to identify. As an example, I identify with Georgette, not because I've ever been gay or inclined or anything of that nature, but what I identify with in Georgette is a sense of alienation. I know he had to have that same sense of alienation that I've lived with all my life. So there's that point. Now I can create a life for Georgette that I have never actually lived, but I can do it from the inside out because I understand Georgie's core. What kind of pleasure did you take in writing some violent scenes like rapes, lynching, or the famous sequence of the dogs? Pleasure. God, I don't think that's the word. I don't, I don't think I had any pleasure in, in writing. As a matter of fact, I remember being very nauseous, um, sometimes severely sick to my stomach, especially that, that rape thing. I, it was. You know, I mean, I, it's hideous, but unfortunately, it's true. I mean, those things, those things happen a million times more than anybody's aware of. But no, there was no pleasure. The closest, there's not a pleasure, but there is a satisfaction eventually in knowing you did what the work demanded you do, even though it made you sick. And the dogs, that thing, and when that first came on the paper, I didn't want to know about it. I, I didn't want to have anything to do with that. It startled me. But I had always made a commitment that if it comes to my mind, I put it on the paper and I do it. So I, I wrote it and that, that whole dog thing was all came out in one sequence later edited. Um, but it was disgusting. And then as part of the book, when I finished the first draft, I read it and it worked. So I had to, I had no choice. I had to leave it in there. My first four books were totally pathological. And what I've attempted to do in this most recent book, The Willow Tree, is to not only look at the problem, but to provide an answer and to say how you get from the problem to the answer. First of all, confession. That's a total projection. You have no idea what he will or will not say is a total, total, absolute judgment. And your judgments are always negative. And they're always an attack. And remember, every time you attack somebody, you are really attacking yourself. And you're chewing yourself up. Right. Very good. Absolutely. That's a good place to start. Okay. Is it an altar? No, actually it's purely aesthetic and it's something that has just sort of developed. I, um, I buy, quite often I'll buy reproductions from the museums. A lot of these things, that, this, this. And that's a Thai Buddha and I, I, I liked it so I bought it. I put that there. And then people give me things. My son's wife gave me this. My wife gave me that nativity set. Some friends gave me things from Costa Rica. This is one of them. That's one of them. It's just a lot of... Well, another friend gave me that reclining Buddha. But it's just purely aesthetic, nothing religious about it. Do you believe in God? Depends upon you how you define the word. I would have to say no, because I believe what most people refer to as God is really an anthropomorphic creation of the ego. 
we created God in our own image. So I don't believe in that, no. So I, it's not that I'm trusting something unknown or unseen, but I'm believing in my own experience in this world, and it has never, ever failed me. I look back upon my life, and even if I didn't believe it at the time, it has never failed me. Our son, Billy, elected to stay with me when my wife left. And that's the only reason I wasn't consumed by grief and loneliness. He was 12 and more than capable, but I had to enroll him in school, make sure he had the needed supplies, sign all the forms. I signed one with an X and he said they wouldn't accept that. I told him to say I was illiterate. He shook his head. So I added a junior after the ex, and he said, now it's kosher. <laughs> I'd get him up in the morning, somehow take him shopping for clothes, and whatever else I did. His needs were the only motivation I had for getting out of bed, my only reason to bother living. So we were on welfare, and one day my wife called and said she was in love with somebody else. And something most remarkable happened in my life. The next morning I was praying for her and I heard myself thanking God. And I, I usually pray out loud so I can hear myself. There's a big difference in hearing something coming from the outside in and from just thinking about it. So I pray out loud and I heard myself thanking God that she had somebody to love, that she had someone to share her life with, to share her body with, to share her God with. And it just transformed me. It precipitated, I guess, one of the most powerful experiences I ever had. And that's when it really generated in all of my being the fact that I truly do know how to love, that I've always had this. But you see, when my wife left, I had a pain in my heart that I had never had in my life. I thought. The expression broken heart was just an expression. I didn't know it was a physical reality. It was unbelievable. And I believe that somewhere I made a decision to be unaware of my decision so that I was always a victim. I wasn't responsible for the dreadful things in my life. And it's not true. So in this case, what happened was I'm, after my wife gave me that information, Instead of going into resentment and a terrible hatred I used to in situations like a terrible fantasies, a hideous, heinous kind of fantasies that just consumed me and poisoned me. Instead, I just made the decision to love. And I took the necessary action, which was to pray for her and be grateful for her. And then this whole other thing happened. So that's what I say when I believe I am locked in hell, and I've never known a hell like that. I'm at the gates of heaven. But I have to surrender myself in order to wake up at the gates of heaven. What in the hell am I really grieving? Am I grieving over a lost childhood, the one I feel I never had, the years I feel were ripped away from me? Would I still feel so overwhelmed with sadness if I hadn't been taken off a ship in Germany at the age of 18 and spent four years in bed and had half my body chopped away? Is it simply self-pity tearing my heart in shreds over an ice cream cone I didn't get when I was a kid? Is it the agony of my wife leaving me that makes it so easy for me to forget the joy of walking down the street? hand in hand with Billy. How can I so easily forget the laughter in his eyes and the love in his heart? Oh, dear God, dear sweet God, please don't let me shroud my son's future with the loneliness of my past. Oh yeah, I always have a good time.
Thank you. See, it did the same thing. I, I, I run it down to, I got for like, at least 10 years at no trouble. And then every now and then it would go click, and the sound would stop, but the lights would stay on. And then eventually it just went click, and the lights went out, no sound, but still power going in, because the other components that I had plugged in here, they would light up. Okay, okay. So let me call it tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon? Uh-huh. Okay, man. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you. Take care. Thanks a lot.